Good morning. Uh, will you please join with me in prayer? Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be worthy in your sight. O oh rock, O oh my redeemer. Amen. Sweet. Okay. The eye of God, as seen up on one of the various screens, is a planetary nebula that exists in the constellation Aquarius. This nebula is not visible with the human eye, only through a massive telescope like the Hubble. It is officially called the Helix Nebula, but is also known as the Eye of God because it appears to have an almond-like shape of a human eye with an iris at the center, as if it were an eye looking at Earth. The nebula is about 700 light years in diameter. This may not seem like much, but if you were traveling at the speed of light, you could make it from here to Pluto 1,121,794 times in the same distance. It is fitting then that it is called the eye of God, since Christianity believes that the universe cannot contain God. But then let us consider that the universe wouldn't even be able to hold the eye of God. It is ultimately an insignificant comparison. Now, I, I don't want to cause you any undue stress or any existential crises out there. The reality is that to some degree, God is incomprehensible to humans. The Bible is God put into human understanding, which is as limited as the human mind when it comes to understanding God. Our reading today in Isaiah is a good example of this incomprehensibility of God. God is shown to be sat on a throne in the temple in Jerusalem, which is so large that only the hem of God's robes are visible. Angels float around the area and proclaim God's glory in voices that shake the literal foundation. The whole thing looks like the inner sanctum of the Temple of Jerusalem, which was inaccessible to anyone but the high priest. All this is meant to show how utterly terrified Isaiah was to see such a mighty God using language that the readers of the time would understand. If the Lord's servants could shake the ground with their voices, and only God's robes were visible, how much would Isaiah be able to stand being in the presence of the Lord without being killed? Like a bug clinging to the windshield at 100 miles per hour, Isaiah was in over his head in the presence of something that he could not comprehend. But so too were people confounded by Jesus, Nicodemus, a head priest of the temple was blown away by Jesus' talk about being reborn, not physically, but spiritually. To put it another way, people have a hard time comprehending the totality of God. We can get the basic ideas like love and grace, but there is so much more to God that we don't understand. I'll look back to our Isaiah reading for an example. Before our reading, God is talking about how Jerusalem 
has strayed from the teachings laid down by Moses. After Isaiah speaks up and asks to be sent to tell the people, God literally orders Isaiah not to be understood. May the hearts of this people be calloused, make their ears dull and closed. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn back and be healed. Then said I, for how long, Lord? And he answered, until the cities lie in ruins without inhabitants, until their houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. Dang. This, this is strange to us, isn't it? Doesn't it? It doesn't sound like something that Jesus would say. That's pretty clear. Our understanding of Jesus is that God would save the world. So why would God also want to destroy the people of Judah? It almost, it almost sounds like Jesus and God Avenge are two separate beings, the vengeful God of the Old Testament and the new nice God of the New Testament. But this whole conflict, this whole separation comes from our simplified idea of God. It comes from our inability to comprehend everything that God is. In our modern culture, we like to boil down Jesus' message of sacrifice, forgiveness, and ultimate love till it becomes a caricature of God. We see Jesus as sort of a grandparent figure, someone who ignores our bad behavior, who lets us do what we please and ultimately won't punish us because they're so nice. This isn't the reality of God. That's like seeing only one cluster of stars in the eye of God. God is so much more complex than that. Jesus shows God love, God's love, yes, and Jesus' sacrifice forgives our sins now and in the future, but love without justice is not love. If God doesn't demand justice for wrongs, then God doesn't really love everyone. God instead is just a passive force that suggests good things should happen. But God loves, and therefore God wants to see change. God loves us so much God won't tolerate when we mistreat other people or see us ignoring the thing God knows will make us good people. This is why God wants to punish Jerusalem in Isaiah, not because God is an angry, whiny kid who doesn't like, who doesn't like when people refuse to follow the rules, but because God cares so deeply about everything. God may be bigger than we can comprehend, but God also cares about every single thing more than we can comprehend. We often read these terrifying passages of God smiting or being angry and forget the context. If God is angry, it means God cares. If God didn't get angry, it would tell us that God doesn't care about the wrongs in this world. Yet we have plenty of times where the God of the Old Testament behaves like the God we know in the New Testament. God spares all the righteous people of Sodom and, of Sodom and Gomorrah from the judgment in Genesis. God hears the pleas of the Israelites in the Exodus and completely 
turns away from judging Nineveh in the book of Jonah. And God proclaims love for the whole world in Isaiah and promises to restore Israel eternally for the punishment that they endured in multiple prophetic books. The fact that God is so harsh in the Old Testament is because God wants the Israelites to be the people of God. That's a high, high standard to live up to. So when the Israelites break the rules, God gets more upset with them than the other countries. God's punishment in the Old Testament aren't punishments, per se, but corrections. To say that the God of the Old Testament is vengeful or an angry God is once again to ignore the complexity of God. It's to look at a single star in the sky and saying that that is God. How else can I show this complexity? Have you ever seen a description of the Trinity? It is Trinity Sunday, after all. There are plenty of ways people have tried to describe the Trinity, but almost all of them are considered heretical. There's simply not a simplified human way to describe three persons of God being one but still being distinct from one another. How can Jesus be holy God, but not be the Father who is also holy God? The Trinity is just a example of the complexity of God. But I hear what you're thinking. So what do we do? How can we understand God if all of our understanding is human and limited Simply put, we don't have to understand all of God. We can't. It's pointless to stress over it. We just need to keep in mind that God is bigger than our understanding. I had a fellow minister once tell me, if you think you have God nailed down, then chances are you're the furthest from understanding God that you can be. There is always something more to keep in mind about God. But there is another way, and I'm sure you'll be shocked to hear it. It's every Sunday school answer. Jesus. Jesus is God incarnate. Even if it were over 2,000 years ago, Jesus tells us the essence of God. If you understand Jesus, you don't need to know anything else. As a famous Rabbi Hillel once said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That is the whole Torah, the whole Bible. The rest is commentary. My message to you is this. We will never know the whole of God. And we shouldn't deceive ourselves to believe we speak the exact words of God. Just as at the moment we can't travel fast enough to reach the eye of God. But we can know the essence of God and what God wants us to tell the world through Jesus Christ. Amen.